In Christ alone is the message today. Paul cried out for these people he did not know. I think I've met Mr. James about 85 times as he came in today. I keep asking him his name because I'm terrible with names. He's usually dressed a lot better than I am. <laughs> so I'll recognize him because he's the well-dressed person. He came in and he, he's dressed the way I want to dress right there today. But, you know, Paul didn't know these people that he started praying for. Never met them. But yet he, he started out chapter 2 saying... I want to intercede in a way that it causes me pain. If your name's on our prayer list, which I'm going to guarantee every one of you, your name's on our list. Even if it's not printed, we walk these pews up and down. And our memory serves us. Oh, this is where the Devons would sit. Oh, this is where my brother Matthew sits. Oh, this is where Amy sits. We pray over people individually and we cry out. And he's, he's in this moment of pleading. Verse 8 is, a, is where our text starts. And we're going to, you know, we, we went through, we had verse 8 as our last verse last week, but we're going we're gonna to hit it again because it's important. There's another side to that verse. Paul wants, it's his, Paul's response to a man-made religion is what today's text is all about. That doesn't apply today, does it? We don't want to sculpt God into what we want out of God, right? That would never happen today. Whether it be in the church or from outside the church, we like to make a faith, your faith and my faith, will just, will coexist, right? Paul's response to a man-made religion. Man-made faith. See, Paul was speaking out against those that were within the church as well as those were, that were outside of the church and the influences that they had. I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of his word. We're in Colossians 2, verses 8 through 23. A little bit of a text today. We're going to get our Catholic knees going, right? Up and down, up and down, Neil. <laughs> this is his word. I'm going to read from the top. See to it that no one takes you captive. Church say captive. Yeah. through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Yes. For in Christ, the church say in Christ, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, there it is again, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Amen. Yeah. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands, your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. <laughs> nailing it to the cross and having disarmed. Church say disarmed. disarmed. Disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over but triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. There it is again. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They are puffed up with their idle notions and by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection from the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental and spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you still submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have 
to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of self-wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value of restraining sensual indulgence. Father, we ask that you allow this word to sink into our very nature, that our nature may conform to yours, that we, our mere presence into a room or into an office or into a grocery store will omit your authority. That where we walk, your spirit walks with us. Your influence walks with us. Father, we need your influence now more than ever. In a world that wants to influence the church, in a world where the church wants to influence the church, we need your influence. May we be attached to the head and not detached. Father, your message, your gospel is good news. It's good news and it needs to be heard. There are forces from within the church and forces from outside the church that want to water down or want to stiffen up what your good news is. Give us the ability to be you in spite of ourselves. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. In Christ alone. I wish I could say those three words over and over and over again. Many of you have heard that I, it's not me that allows myself to come up and preach. I'm not a speaker. Serious confidence issues and stuttering problems that I had as a child. You'd never guess I'd be speaking for a living. Because that's what everybody thinks we're pastors do, right? We only work an hour a week, we speak, and then we're done, right? Mm. Ooh, glory, I wish that was true. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> what a job. Yeah. What a job. But I see, it's only through Christ that I'm able to speak Another public fact about me is I'm not a big fan of the jail ministry. It makes me nervous. It's uncomfortable. Oh, but I tell you, every time I walk out of those doors, I know that God is working. And that includes I get to spend time with a brother who, outside of his one hour a week, he gets to see me because I've talked to a person that's over the jail. She tells me those that have been to have a have a little bit of a record know that there's a there's a certain place in jail where you don't get much free time. But that's where he's at. He's he's got this idea he's gonna convert me. I'm telling me that's a hostile spiritual situation. But maybe Jesus just wants me to love him. I might have even open up the word, yeah. I just want to go in and talk to him and love on him. And boy, I tell you what, I get nervous when I go to see him. But I leave there going, oh, I saw a little glimmer of hope. He calls us to be uncomfortable. He calls us to, and I'm a, I'm a mirror image, some of the voice clips that I've heard from our general superintendent last night. He calls us to not sit on a pew, but to do work out there. See, he equipped the disciples and sent them out two by two. We're not called to do it alone. That was part of my devotion this morning. We're not called to do this alone. So, so as far as you lone ranger Christians out there, I don't need church. I don't. I can do this on my own. No, you can't. You were never. You were never supposed to do this on your own. Jesus gathered his disciples and sent them. It was Jesus that gave him them authority over the powers, the demons, and the sicknesses. In Christ alone. We looked at verse 8 last week, last week and it's, it was a warning. we we'll do something a little bit different. We're just going to go through the verses. In Christ alone, see that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, rather than Christ. So we can look at this verse as a warning. Be careful. Or we can flip that coin over and say, guess what? Christ has our, has our destination. Christ has what we're supposed to be listening to. 
I wonder where, where, if there was a book we could read that would tell us what Christ would want us to listen to. I just wonder, there's an app for that too. You can get it on your phone, you can get an app for it, and you get all the, all the translations possible. You want to listen to the words spoken in Hebrew? Guess what? It, it, there's an app for that. You want to hear the list spoken in, in Spanish? I'm, there's nothing more self or spiritually satisfying to me than to hear prayer in another tongue. And I'm listening to some of these video clips from the General Assembly, and some of those worship songs are starting to be sung in different languages. And I'm going to tell you, oh, glory. <laughs> I'm so glad that God doesn't only speak English. Because there are some pretty languages out there. To know that there's this, there's this intertwining of syllables that I have no idea what they mean or nothing but glorifying to God. In Christ, he said that there's going to be forces out there. He doesn't want you to take be captive. If I'm going to be captive by the world, what's that mean I get in Christ? Nobody can take away my freedom. Doesn't that come from a movie? Freedom I have in Christ. The world looks to shackle the freedom that we have in truth. One of the comments that I've recently come across here, here in just in recent days is, but, but your Christianity has all these shackles of rules. Well, they've got some guidelines, absolutely. These are ways of, well, what happens if you, if you don't obey that rule? Then I ask for forgiveness. Because I know that rule is coming from somebody outside of me that knows the effects of what that rule does to me. I could have biblically defend smoking cigarettes, and I did for 21 years until God said, let me talk to you. See, I don't condemn people if they smoke or they drink. I saw a, a, a short video not long ago, and the pastor was approached, can you, do I have to smoke, stop smoking marijuana if I become a Christian? He goes, nope. You know, weed, pot, big old fat doobie. Do they still call them doobies? Yeah. <laughs> Do I have to quit smoking? He said, and this guy reaches in and he, and he rolls a big old fatty right in front of him. Do I have to give this up if I give my life to Christ? He said, no. Well, I don't understand. He goes, you're right, you don't. Do you clean yourself up before you get in the shower? Or do you go in the shower to clean yourself up? See, now he's going he's gonna to lead you away from that. I don't have to worry about preaching to it. He's going to lead you away from that. I had a pastor that once took a chance on me because he thought my worldly experience would do well on this, on this church board, and I was a smoker, open about it. And he met with me. He said, do you want to quit smoking? I said, absolutely. It's hard to find a medication that's cheaper than the product. I told him where I was at with my devotional life and, and my spiritual life, and he said, all right, God will take care of it. I don't have to worry about it. I was on the board. They didn't like, a lot of people didn't like me being on the board. But God was working through me. See, was there a part of my life that was tarnished? Absolutely. Was there a part of my life that was in bondage? Absolutely. But see, a pastor couldn't relieve me of my bondage. A church board could not relieve me of my bondage. Oh, but the closer I got to God, the more he spoke to me. <laughs> in Christ alone. We have confidence in Christ. We have confidence in Christ. Looking at verses 9 through 15, it's 9 that tells us, go ahead, you're, you're, Jesus is God. Period. There are many people out there that will argue that point with you. Ah, he was the son. He was one of many sons. I actually had a couple of people knock on my door. I'm not going to name any uh, denominational structures, but called themselves missionaries and knocked on my door and wanted to share some tracks with me. I said, you know, I, I, I have a lot of tracks in this book. I said, I, I, I appreciate the work you're doing, but I have a problem with some of the beliefs because you one of the most primary ones that you have is you don't believe that Jesus was God. 
And it says over and over and over in this book. I said, let me show you what I'm working on. I'm like, oh, oh, you're a preacher. Yeah, I'm working on this sermon. Let me show you this verse here. Hey, I was excited. Well, we appreciate your time, sir. <laughs> I might have been blacklisted. They might be the last time that they ever. I think now from here on out, whoever knocks on my door is going to be the Amazon guy. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. For in Christ, the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Amen. The fullness of the deity of God lives in bodily form. Not the part. It wasn't just this pointer finger, shame on you, that was God. The fullness of God was in bodily form. Oh, I don't know about y'all, but that's pretty confident. He could be God in bodily form. That doesn't mean that I can be God, but I know that if he calls me to do something, oh, he, he can fill me with whatever power that he needs to fill me with. It doesn't matter if I'm one of those guys with, with five talents or if I'm one of the guys with one talent. I know no matter, if I get a half a talent, if he says go out there and, and, and use that talent, I know that he's not sending me out there uninformed or uneducated or unequipped. He gives me the equipping, the equipment of the Holy Spirit, not part of the Holy Spirit. The fullness, the authority of all things. Christ had, you know, through his miracle ministry. We the Nazarenes don't like to hear about that first miracle of turning water into wine, but that was over the physical world. He started proving his power and authority over the world. I can heal this diseases. I can heal this demon possession. That's the spiritual world. I can bring back to life, life restoration. He has authority over anything and everything that we can possibly look into. Verse 11 tells us he is part of God. We are part of God's people. Part of God's people. Go ahead and put that verse up there. In him you were circumstanced. In him, in Christ. I'm not in Daryl. I'm not in the church of the Nazarene. I'm in Christ circumcised. What that means is he, he took that part of the heart that was of the world. And it removed the world's part of the heart. I remember Pharaoh from like your Sunday school ages. The Pharaoh's heart kept getting hardened. It was the opposite process of circumcision of the heart. It was that hardness of the heart that kept him from seeing God and God's will. We are part of God's people. God has cut the sin part of our lives out. We had a brother come in a couple weeks ago uh, from a, a little bit northeasterly. Brother David Shelton, he said, I, I, quit the, I quit the sin business. Isn't that what he said? I quit the sin business. Why is because God has cut that business out of our life. His procedures are perfect. Versus the next couple of verses, we, we are spiritually alive. This is how we have complete confidence in him. We are spiritually alive. We were once dead. We couldn't see what his will was. But now he's alive. Looking at verses 12 and 13. Having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, he also raised him from the dead. We were buried with Christ and we are now alive. Man, that's confidence. I've gone from spiritual death and now I'm spiritually alive. Does that not give me the excitement? Man, that excites me to know that I can go out there where all this hot mess is happening and we're about to go into another political year. It's just going to get crazier. I can go out there and say, guess what? I'm alive. Well, why, why would you care about my spirituality? I was asked that this week. Because I'm alive in my spirituality. I've got a life in my... How's that working for you? You get two hours a week, only one because it's religious. How, how are you alive when you spend... All but two hours a week in a tomb. I'm alive. Now whether or not you want that life, that's up to you. 
Can't force you to have it, but it's there for you. It's confidence. Verses 13 to 14, he forgave our sins and canceled our debt. Oh my goodness. Hallelujah. He canceled the charge. Anybody ever pay off a car? Anybody pay off a car? Come on. When you got that last payment in, man, it felt great, didn't it? Did you turn around and make another payment the following month? Totally got quiet. Anybody pay off a house? Did you continue making mortgage payments as soon as it's over with? Now we're moving up here and we sold our house. Boy, we paid that off. I was like, can you imagine? Now the credit bureau thinks that I paid off a house. All I did was pay off a loan with someone else's money who wanted to buy my house. But that didn't mean I continued sending in mortgage payments. See, that's what we do with our sin, friends. Oh, I can't do what God's calling me to do because I'm, you just don't know where I've been, Pastor. You don't know the road up. He's canceled that debt. Stop paying the bill. Stop paying the bill that someone else has paid. You feel guilty and want to continue paying the bill? Boy, there's a lot of work that can be done around this church. I'm not above taking some guilt work. But I'm going to tell you it's not needed. We continue paying the sin bill. He canceled our debts. He canceled our debts. In Christ alone. Verse 15, he gives us victory over our enemies. He disarmed the powers. Oh, we allow those powers to have control over us. Nicotine, they say, is the second most addictive chemical out there outside of caffeine. I got to have my coffee. I don't. He hasn't convicted me of that one yet. I really pray he doesn't because I've got some really good coffee at the house. Y'all know I'm a coffee snob. I get my coffee from Hawaii. So I pray that he never convicts me, but I'm not going to stop my growth just because of my love of coffee. But he has canceled the power of our sin over us. Does that mean I won't be tempted? Absolutely not. You light a cigarette in front of me in front of traffic. I don't care if you're three or four cars up. I can smell that freshly lit cigarette. And it smells good. You take that third hit off of a cigarette and I'm about to throw it. That's what he's done, right? Smoked for 21 years. I, I did it because I liked it. Doesn't mean I won't love you if you smoke. My hugs might not last as long. That's okay. I'll still love you. But I don't, I don't feel like I, that, that cigarette has power over me anymore. I don't think of that cigarette when I wake up. I don't think of it after a good meal. Let me tell you, I've had a couple of those this week. I, I got to celebrate my birthday on Tuesday, and my wife knows I love uh, lasagna. She made lasagna in the crock pot. Uh, um, it's something that she could do and still be able to work. They would. It was pretty good. Growing up, that was one of our traditions. Uh, this is free, by the way. This is not part of the sermon, but this is free. We got to choose our birthday meal. I don't know about y'all, but it's hot out there. Now, we lived in Tennessee and during my high school years, East Tennessee, and not only was it hot, it was humid. We didn't have AC in our house. Hot and humid. Now, Mom would ask, what do you want for your birthday? I want lasagna. It's too hot for that. All right, fine. I'll do pork chops. And mac and cheese and spinach. That was my second my runner-up. My mom loved it when, whenever we asked for something grilled because we kept the heat out of the kitchen. So I got to do that on yesterday. I cooked my, I cooked my birthday dinner, uh, my second one. My mom would celebrate all, all month long. It's her birthday month. But see, he gives us victory over our spiritual enemies. Doesn't mean temptation won't be there. But it's not everything that I think of. He made a public spectacle. Oh, glory. He doesn't do anything in secret. You want to be released from your sin? Don't be scared of him making it public. Because he wants the testimony and the glory to give it right back to him. I'm going to tell you, friends, my God is in the multiplication business. He's going to multiply 
your victory in someone else's life. He's going to multiply the victory in someone else's life. Not only that, we, we can sit here and say, I've got victory. I, I, I brought it up before, but my brother John went in for eye surgery. It was supposed to be a couple hours because he had a detached retina. And the doctor said, I'm sorry, there wasn't there anything detached anymore. Victory in Christ alone. The fact that I'm standing here right now tells you I have victory in Christ alone. Does that mean that I have no battles? Absolutely not. Do I know that those battles may last a little bit longer than I liked them? But I'm going to tell you, I can tell with all confidence that the battle is going to have victory in Christ alone. He gives us victory. We have freedom in Christ alone. We have truth, we have confidence, and then we have freedom in Christ. And that's over the last couple verses. I, it's all over the place. We have freedom from legalism within the church. Oh, I don't know. Boy, well, there's some folks that were upset with the idea of me sitting on a church board because I was a smoker. The church was going through some seriously specific issues and problems. And they needed someone that had a little bit of a history with business. You know, there were some legalistic folks that did not want me sitting on that board. I could care less. It didn't matter to me. I was, some, I was somebody to come in. I, I, I teach the kids for Bible quiz and I teach Sunday school and my little pew was nice and warm. I had my thing that I did. Whether or not the church was open or not, there were, this is Pensacola, Florida. There's churches everywhere. See, Paul was addressing issues from within the church here. The problem with legalism is what happens when I start focusing on you instead of Christ. That's where legalism comes in. And we're all subject to it. When I first moved here, I got, was told to seek, seek out the Ministerial Area Alliance. It's, a, it's a, a group of a bunch of pastors of all different denominations. And we had a gentleman that was a Lutheran. Long beard and long hair. I don't know if you guys know who he was, but man, I loved him. I only met him a couple times. I only got to have a couple conversations with him before he moved on to another church in another state. He said, you know the problem with you uh, holiness folks is? No, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. Because <laughs> you're too legalistic. I said, you know, you're right. We get so focused on the list of rules that we forget the author of the list of rules. When I'm more focused on what you're doing right or wrong, then I'm not focused on him. Now, if I, if I come to you and I say, you know, hey, uh, I've got some relationship with, with some of you in here today that you, that you, I can speak on a more level base. But if I come to you and say, hey, I see this behavior and it's going to hurt your relationship with Christ. I was never approached like that. I was like, you're a smoker. Are you sure you should be here? It's all about the have it. See, we have freedom from religion. Paul is addressing this. If we look to keep our eyes focused on Christ, he'll fix everything else. I'm probably telling you, he's good at that. Yes. I'm evidence of that. Anybody else evidence of him fixing things in your life? Come on, I wish the camera could see all the hands. Oh, yes. Glory. Why? Because when we get close to the truth, the truth will set us free. I heard that read somewhere. We serve a jealous God who desires it first, one who's only and the one and the only one worthy of our praise. Thank goodness he says, go ahead and eat that bacon. <laughs> Thank goodness he said, go ahead and eat that shrimp. It was, a, it was a law not to eat no scalish fish. Y'all folks that like to go catfishing out of the what, are, what is the west side, what, what, whatever this river is over here? White river? It ain't all that white, I want to tell you. <laughs> but I hear all these tales of these big old catfish. They don't got a scale on them. Them legalistic folk, I don't know about eating that fish. It's got no scales. Sharks good too. They got no scales either. See, well, the more we look at the the object, if our object of observation is the action, we're forgetting the source. If we just focus on the source, 
encourage that growth. Opportunities will present us to, to help raise a brother or sister in Christ the way that he wants us to, to phrase it. That pastor who took a chance on me, oh, he was talking about a compassionate heart. Love him like a brother. We prayed for him often in our prayer groups. He lost his wife a couple of years ago, but I'm going to tell you, he, uh, I was able to say, brother, Pastor Joe, I don't know how to knock this smoking thing. Have you given it to the Lord? Of course. No, have you really given it to the Lord? It's not about the smoke. Let's, let's, let's look at what the Lord wants to do in your life. How does the Lord want to sculpt you? I started to research that question. I started growing in that question. Boy, I let the Lord speak to me. Now, it wasn't a sermon that spoke to me. It wasn't a Bible study. It was God himself. He gave me freedom from that word, from that legalism. Freedom from self-righteousness. Verse 23 tells us all about that. It says, when it becomes all about my opinions and my views, my translation of the text, if it starts to, you start to hear that, you better hit that door running. If all you're hearing is, well, the way I feel about this is, the way I think, what I think this says is, my, that, I don't like that verse because of my opinion. I heard that in an interview this week. It's an hour long interview and I wanted to be, I didn't want to be impartial to my own personal views. It's good to look outside of your own personal views it's just as a check on yourself. And I listened to an hour long interview on a particular very hot social topic within the church. And this person, the interviewee, was all about, well, my view is this. My view is that. And the counterpart to that interview was the more conservative run. And he said, well, it says here in the Bible. 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 Over in this text, it wasn't about his own. He goes, I just want to, I just want to line up with God's word. I just want to line up with him. I want his views to be mine. I don't want my view. I want my views to bend to him, not his views to bend to mine. And I heard in this other interview, and it's, well, how it differs from my view is this. Friends, if you ever hear that come out of my mouth, you better hit that door running. If you can't hit that door running, ask Ms. Zuel, ask Ms. Nancy, I'll help you down them stairs. I'll make sure I'll give you a good head and start. Run. Self-righteousness. It's almost like Ford's going, run, Ford, run. All I did was run. But I think so, so many times we run towards things because it's an easier gospel to swallow. We have freedom from mysticism. It still exists, friends. If you don't think that worship of other powers exists, then you're too stuck in your circle. It's out there. I had a mom contact me through Facebook, asked me to go visit her son. And uh, he does not believe in Jesus Christ. But he's all about spiritual balance. Self-guided spiritual things. I've got my own beliefs. It's okay if you have your own beliefs. The problem is, that, and we had, a, we, we have this even in the church today. Well, if I just love, it doesn't matter how I love. If I just love, isn't that because God's all about love? See, in, the, in this interview that I listened to, Man mentioned love over and over and over time, time and time again, but only correlated with God once and it was out of context. Yes, it's about love. Love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. But we, we go straight past the first, straight to the second. See, that's mysticism. That's, that's just something where I just want to take this part. It doesn't matter what I do with my physical body. As long as I love God, I love you, God. I love you, God. 
See, they were doing it for in, within sexual context back then. We can do it just here too. It doesn't matter. My body, my choice. Love you, God. My body, my choice. I love you, God. See, we can't make scripture to fit our beliefs. We have to make our beliefs to fit scripture. And Paul was warning to that. Our beliefs should point others to him. It shouldn't confuse us. We have gender confusion, marriage confusion. You know who the author of confusion is? It ain't Jesus. All this confusion in the world. But if, if, if you believe this, I'm, I'm just confused. Well, let's get in here to, to get it cleared out. I want to focus on him and Christ alone. See, if, if we're all focused on Christ, there are no denominations, friends. There are none. Oh, but my denomination's got it right. If you don't have this spiritual gift, you're not, in, you're not part of the body. And I've got my, my denomination over here going, oh, we're going to ignore that gift. We believe it's, it exists. But we're going to put it over here in the corner over here. We're not going to talk about it because we get a little bit too itchy if we do. If we're all focused on him, denominational, they, they tend to fall off. Friends, I'm tired of fighting with, with other parts of God's body. I'm tired of having discussions of what I think is right. Let's focus on Christ alone. Let's focus on Christ so much that when we go out there, people don't look, well, you must have that Pentecostal Jesus with you. Oh, you got the Nazarene Jesus. That's a Catholic Jesus. Why? Because he's kneeling every five steps. I just want them to see Jesus. I don't care what version of Jesus you think is right. I want Jesus' version of Jesus. And how else do I know that except I get dug into this book? If you're going to think you're going to know Jesus by just coming to Sunday morning service or tuning us in online, uh, you're, you're, you're hurting. I had that conversation with everybody. I had that conversation with my dad. I don't know if it's guilt. I don't think I can. I don't, can, a, can a pastor have guilt over his father? I don't think so. He's showing up on small groups. He's not as mobile. I'm not as mobile, Pastor. It's hard to get up these stairs. Then tune us in online. I don't like Facebook. I don't care. Is it Facebook or is your spiritual walk more important? You want us to be able to stream to other, other platforms outside of Facebook? Then donate more. We do what we can afford around here. Facebook's free. Free is good. <laughs> free is good. That's from a board member. Christ alone. I have freedom from all these things, but what good is my freedom if I don't use it? I believe in constitutional rights, and I believe that if we don't use our rights, we lose them. But I'm going to tell you the same message applies for our spiritual freedom. How can we boast in spiritual freedom if we don't use it? It's easy to claim spiritual freedom when you're in these doors or in these walls. Claim that spiritual freedom out there. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up. In Christ alone. There's a hymn that says, In Christ alone, my hope is found. Not in Daryl. Not in church polity, not in church denominational structure, not in the spiritual gifts, not in the spiritual fruit, in Christ alone. See, when we're on Christ, everything else kind of falls into place, doesn't it? If we're focused on Christ, then the person jumping up and down, worshiping God, woo, ain't gonna, ain't gonna throw us off track. If we're focused on Christ, it doesn't matter what possibility of any distraction might exist. I've had our children's leaders come up and say, I'm so sorry, I got a little loud down there tonight. Who cares? 
I wasn't focused on the kids. You want to see a good Bible study? Come, come Sunday night. I, I dare you. You want the in-person Bible study? Sunday night is your spot. You want ladies? You want to have an in-person Bible study? Seek out Miss Mary every other week. It's not even every week. So those always say, well, it's kind of hard to do it every week, Pastor. Well, I'm kind of busy. In person. I'd love to come in person on Wednesday. The only reason I went to the parsonage is because nobody was showing up here. Parsonage has better internet. Why? Because we get what we pay for here. I pay for it over there. I know it was a good, it's a good connection over there. I don't have 16 people on it with me either. But you want to meet in person? I don't care if it's a Thursday or a Monday or a Tuesday. Let me know. <laughs> in Christ alone. That's my prayer today. That we go out into our worlds and we affect it for Christ himself. Who cares what Daryl thinks? Who cares what Daryl gets out of it? Who cares what Billy Bob or Jim Bob or Sue Ann or Marla, Marla Lee, I'm going to use the names I don't know exist, but I want to tell you there's, some, there's a Jim Bob waiting, watching us online and waiting for that personal invitation. We have truth in Christ. We have confidence in Christ. And we have freedom in Christ. Do you believe that, friends? Do you believe that our truth is found in Christ alone? That there are, there are forces out in the, in the world that are looking to deceive us, but we have his truth right here. We have confidence that Christ, fully God, has laid the path for us already. We have confidence that God, that Christ fully, fully God has given us spiritual life and has canceled all of our indebts. Oh, that gives me excitement. It's that canceling of the debts that gives us freedom in Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the fact that you alone have canceled our debts. You alone have given us truth. You alone You alone have called us to be the salt and the light of this world. But it's only you alone that flavors that salt or give us this energy to, to have that light. It's you alone that gives us the ability to have a light. It's you alone that gives us the strength to, en to endure the battles, in this, whether they're spiritual or physical or financial. I know that I can have victory in Christ through all of those. Father, give us the desire that we seek you, that we live in your victory and stop going back to the battle of sin that's already been fought. The, one, the battle of sin that's already been finished, it's already been done. Help us remember those line, that line that you gave on the cross before you took your last breath. It is finished. It's done. It's over. Our battle with sin is gone. The, the power of sin over our life has expired. Father, I thank you for your word today. And we ask that you allow this word to live within us. May it be such a force in our life that when we walk into a room, they don't see a Nazarene Jesus, they just see Jesus. They see a Jesus that wants to call them home. They see a Jesus that will soften their heart and remind, remind them that, they, that you have enough grace to cover their sin as well. They see a Jesus that gives them victory over the power of sin and death. That's in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Our doxology again comes out of Jude to him who is able to keep you from stumbling.
friends, Jesus can keep you from stumbling. Before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Friends, know I love you. Know I'm praying for you. Until next week.